Welcome to another video, 345 students. This is Ryan, and today I'm going to take you through the nitration of methyl benzoate experiment. Let's start by talking about the reaction you're going to perform in this lab, which is an aromatic substitution reaction. These reactions involve the joining of an aromatic ring and an electrophile. Electrophiles being something electron deficient that can accept electrons. When these two things come together, the ring shares some of its electrons with the electrophile and forms a bond with it. This creates a resonance stabilized cation intermediate with the positive charge shared by certain carbons in the ring. The reaction finishes up when a Lewis base takes the quote unquote extra hydrogen off and thereby reforms the aromatic ring. If this joining happens to a benzene ring, the electrophile can join to any of the ring's six carbons. Since they're all equivalent, it doesn't matter where the new group attaches to. However, if the ring already has something else attached to it, a substituent group, then the incoming electrophile will be directed to a specific carbon. Which carbon the already existing group directs the electrophile to depends on whether the former is electron donating or electron withdrawing. Electron donating groups include alkyls and hydroxyls, and most any non-halogen substituent in which the atom bonded to the ring has an unshared pair of electrons, such as the nitrogen in an amine or the oxygen in an alkoxy group. These kinds of groups will direct the electrophile to the ortho-para positions, that is, carbons 2 and or 4. Electron withdrawing groups include the nitro group, and groups in which the carbonyl carbon of things like aldehydes and carboxylic acids are attached to the ring. These will direct the electrophile to the meta, or carbon-3 position. Halogens are something of an exception to this. They're considered electron withdrawing because of their electronegativity, but for reasons I'll mention in a minute, they're still orthopara directors. I don't want to get too far into the weeds of why different groups direct electrophiles to one place or another, but suffice it to say it has to do with how well they stabilize, or don't stabilize, the carbocation intermediate. For example, in the case of a para-attachment, the ring's positive charge is shared by the carbons here, here, and here. Something like an alkoxy group can stabilize this particular resonance pattern reasonably well with a further structure, and to a somewhat lesser extent so could a halogen. However, meta-directing groups, like a nitro, tend to destabilize this resonance pattern. Moving the electrophile to the meta position mitigates this problem by putting the positive charge on these other carbons, and that makes nitros and the other groups I mentioned meta directors. Of course, I'm just scratching the surface of the theory here. For more information, see your textbook or lecture notes. In this experiment, you're going to perform a substitution reaction with methyl benzoate. Keeping in mind what I just covered about the kinds of groups that are orthopara directing versus meta directing, you should be able to predict where an electrophile would join to this compound. Your electrophile will be a nitronium ion, which you'll make by mixing nitric acid together with some sulfuric acid. When these two get together, they form nitronium, hydrogen sulfate, and water. Now let's talk procedure. As you know, you're going to be working with both sulfuric acid and nitric acid in this lab. Now, these are both fairly potent acids that can do a lot of damage to whatever they come into contact with. So, before you begin, make sure you have your goggles on and keep them on until you're out of the lab room. You'll also need to have your lab coat on and be wearing gloves. Speaking of acids, one of your first procedure steps will be to add some specific, precise quantities of them to a vial, and the best tool to do this with is one of these, a micropipette. In case you're not familiar with using one, here's how they work. First, you set the amount of liquid you want to dispense with it, which is indicated on its dial. Next, gently but firmly press its end into a tip. This tip is what the liquid you're measuring out will go into, not the micropipette itself. Press the plunger on the pipette down until you feel it hit a stop. This is actually the first of two stops on the pipette. It is physically possible for you to keep pushing the plunger down past the first stop, and later on you will do this, but for now just push it down to the first stop. Next, immerse the end of the tip in the liquid you're dispensing, and relax your thumb enough to let the plunger come back up again. If the container you're adding the liquid to is empty, gently touch the tip to its inside wall near the bottom, 
press the plunger down to the first stop, then push it in a little more to make sure all the liquid gets out of the tip. If the container already has something in it, immerse the tip to just below the surface of this liquid, and like before, push the plunger down past the first stop. When you're done, use the tip ejector to shoot the tip into the appropriate waste container. If you're dispensing multiple liquids into a container, use a different tip for each one so you don't cross-contaminate your reagents. One of the first parts of your procedure will have you use a micropipette to add some sulfuric acid to a conical vial. Along with a spin vane so you can get everything mixed. Later on, you'll perform your reaction in the same vial, and since the reaction will need to start out cold, you'll need to chill the vial on ice for a few minutes. Next, you'll combine some sulfuric acid and nitric acid in another container, and place these acids on ice too. You'll also need to put some methyl benzoate in yet another container and put it on ice. And then you'll add some deionized water to yet another container and, you guessed it, put it on ice. After the vial with the sulfuric acid has had a chance to get good and cold, clamp it above your stir plate and set it to gently stir the solution. Use a Pasteur pipette to slowly transfer the methyl benzoate to this vial, and then, again working slowly, add your nitric and sulfuric acid mixture. After you've added all these things, let the solution stir for several minutes. While you're waiting for your reaction to finish, add a milliliter of DI water to a small tube and another milliliter of methanol to the same tube and place the tube in your ice bath. When the reaction time is up, add about 2 mils of the DI water you put on ice earlier Then remove the spin vane and rinse it off into the vial with the last mill of cold DI water. Put the vial in your ice bath for about 10 minutes and periodically stir it. Eventually, you should get a precipitate. You'll collect your precipitate by vacuum filtration. Try to get the bulk of it out of the vial, but leave a little behind. Later on, you'll use the leftover product in the vial for TLC analysis. Rinse the product in the vacuum funnel with the cold water methanol mixture you prepared, then let it dry for 5 minutes with vacuum air going over it. While you're waiting for your product to dry, Add a mill of dichloromethane to your reaction vial and dissolve all the remaining product that was in it. Once your product in the vacuum funnel has had a chance to partially dry, place it and the paper it's on onto a labeled watch glass with your name and section number and store it in your product storage drawer. In a subsequent lab period, you will weigh your product so you can calculate its yield. Coming back to the leftover product you dissolved in DCM, you will use TLC to analyze this product and compare it to known samples of the three isomers of methyl nitrobenzoate. The solvent you'll use to develop your TLC plate will be a mixture of hexanes and ethyl acetate, but we're not going to tell you what the most optimal ratio of these two solvents is to use for this. Instead, you will prepare four different solvent mixtures, use them to develop four different TLC plates, and determine for yourself which ratio is best. 
After you're done cleaning your glassware, check your bench top for pools, puddles, and or spots of liquid. If you see any, spray a little cleaning solution on the bench and wipe it down with a paper towel. Chemical residues can hide in these spots, and if one appears on your bench after you leave, it may cost you lab points. And as always, make sure aqueous waste goes into the aqueous waste container, organic waste the organic waste container, and solids go in the solid waste container.